The Time and Space of Uncle Albert by Russell Stannard. First published 1989 by Faber and Faber Limited. Chapter 4 Sun, Stones, and Heavy Energy. Plop. Plop. It was a lovely sunny afternoon, about a week later. Uncle Albert and Gadankin were down by the canal. They often went there for walks. From time to time, Gadankin tossed a pebble into the water. Plop. And watched the ripples. Uncle Albert was lying on his back, with a straw hat over his face to shield his eyes from the sun. Would you like to see my project? asked Gadankin. I've brought it with me. She paused expectantly. Thought you'd like to see how it's getting on. How what's getting on? asked Uncle Albert dreamily. My project, my school project, I've written up our discoveries. Oh! She waited. Well? Well what? Oh, forget it. Uncle Albert slowly sat up. Soy, he said, didn't mean to be rude. It's the sun. Always makes me relax. I can show it to you some other time. No, no, said Uncle Albert. Let's have it now. She looked a little nervous. There might be some mistakes in it, she said, as she pulled out a dark green folder from her school briefcase. She handed it to him. Well, I like the cover, he said. It showed a spacecraft, a clock and a ruler, and the title, The Time and Space of Uncle Albert. Not sure about the title, though, he added. I reckon you should have called it The Time and Space of Gedenken and Uncle Albert. Uh, you found out just as much as I have. Oh, Uncle, not really, she replied, blushing just a little bit. Yes, certainly, insisted Uncle Albert. If it hadn't been for you going on the space journeys, I never would have got started. Anyway, that would make the title far too long. It wouldn't fit in. He opened the folder and read through it very carefully. He laughed when he got to the place where Gedanken had drawn a picture of a very thin face on a piece of rubber. When you pulled on the rubber, the face stretched and became suspiciously like his own. Eventually, he closed the folder and handed it back. Very good, Gedanken. That's coming on really well. Do you mean that? You're not just saying it. No, really, I mean it. It's excellent. And what about, you know, mistakes? Well, there aren't any. You've explained things very well. Whew, she looked relieved. Not sure of the spelling in places, mind you, he said, as he lay back and replaced the hat over his face once more. Uh, Gedankin resumed tossing stones into the water. Plop. Plop. Alison's project is coming on well, too. She's doing dinosaurs. Uh, Miss Simpson, the arch teacher, uh, she says they can make some clay ones in pottery class next week. Uh, Frances Alexandra's been showing off, as usual, going on and on about her volcanoes. I don't get it. She's really dumb, but her folder on volcanoes is quite good. I reckon someone's doing it for her. She looked at him. Uncle, are you listening? Yes. Well, I've been thinking... Good, he yawned, all in favour of people thinking. I'm being serious, uncle. Sorry, go on. Well, there are a couple of things about the first space trip I don't understand, she continued. You know how I got heavier? Well, you never told me what actually made me heavier. After all, you said I was still made out of exactly the same material as before. Uh, there were no extra layers of fat on me or anything of that sort, so I can't see where the difference comes in. Why does something moving weigh more than it does when it's standing still? Her question was greeted with silence. She waited, and then she leaned over and whispered in his ear, Uncle, did you hear what I said? Are you asleep? Huh? Uh, no, uh, no, said Uncle Albert, pulling himself together. He removed his hat and sat up again. He looked about him as though searching for something. What have you lost? asked Gedankin. Uh, nothing. I, I was just looking for a couple of stones. Uh, can you find me two pebbles? You know, about the same size. Gedankin hunted along the stones near her feet. Will these do? she said, holding out a couple. Uh, yes, they're, they're pretty much the same. Uh, agreed? Yes. Uh, all right then, watch this. With that, he placed one of the stones in the palm of his hand and lazily lobbed it into the canal beside him. 
plop. The ripples gently spread outwards. Okay, said Uncle Albert, what's going to happen if I toss this other one into the water? Gedankin paused. Well, it's obvious, isn't it? It'll make a splash. Uh, how big a splash? Same as before, of course. To Gedankin's surprise, he drew his arm back and hurled the stone with all of his might into the water close by. Splash! The water went all over the place, quite a bit wetting their clothes. Oh, uncle, exclaimed Gedankin angrily, jumping up and shaking herself off. Now look what you've done, that was stupid. Just making a point, he replied mischievously. You said the splash would be the same as before. Yes, but I didn't know you were going to do that, she protested. Anyone knows you'll get a bigger splash if you throw it harder. She stopped wiping her jeans and sat down again. Sorry said Uncle Albert. Actually, I wasn't expecting it to go quite all over the place. Don't worry. Don't know my own strength. In fact, come to think of it, he said painfully, feeling his shoulder, I reckon I've pulled a muscle. Good. Serves you right. Anyway, said Uncle Albert as they settled down again, the point I was trying to make was that we had two stones. They were identical. They had the same amount of material in them, the same stuff. Yet one made a big splash, while the other a small one. The difference? Energy. One had more energy than the other, and that's why it made a bigger disturbance. Like Daryl Curtis. Daryl Curtis? What's he got to do with it? Well, he's always making a disturbance. In class, he's over-energetic. That's why he's such a frightful nuisance, I've heard the teachers say. Hmm. Well, I don't know about that, said Uncle Albert. And then he added... Actually, come to think about it, I suppose it is a bit like that, yes. Uh, you could have a pair of identical twin boys, one with lots of energy, always rushing about playing football, and the other always sprawled out in front of the television, doing nothing. Yes, I suppose it's a bit like that. Anyway, he resumed, I was talking about those stones. One had more energy than the other. Now, why do you think that was? Well, you threw it harder, of course. And the other one you only lobbed it gently, said Gedankin. Right, so the harder you push on something, the more energy you give it. With the second stone, I started pushing on it way back here. Oh, he squeaked as he tried to go through the motion of throwing again. I have pulled something. Oh, poor uncle, soothed Gedankin, hardly able to suppress a little giggle. Let me give it a rub. She knelt beside him and began gently massaging his shoulder. A bit higher. Ah, that, that's it. That's, ah, that's better, he said. Right, now, where was I? Ah, yes, I was saying that with the second stone, I was pushing on it more, and it moved through a much bigger distance. And that's how it got more energy than the first one. Yes, uncle, but what's all this got to do with things getting heavier? I'm trying to explain. You said earlier that you couldn't see the difference between something when it's standing still and when it's moving. Well, there is a difference. When it is moving, it's got energy. And the reason why it's heavier is that energy itself is heavy. Energy is heavy, said Gedankin, looking puzzled. Yes, replied Uncle Albert. That is what we've discovered. Everything must have heaviness. Tables, chairs, pop records, puddings, everything's got heaviness, depending on how much stuff is in it. A table's heavier than a pudding because it takes up more matter, more stuff to make a table than to make a pudding. Everyone knows that. What's new? What we've discovered is that energy is also heavy. A pudding flying through the air will have energy and so will be heavier than the same pudding sitting still on a plate. And that's the same for your space capsule. The faster it went, the more energy it had, and the heavier it got. Gedankin brightened up. And are you saying then that the rocket was pushing on the capsule, even though it wasn't getting much faster because of the speed limit, the rocket was still giving the capsule more and more energy, and the more energy it got, exactly, the heavier it got, said Uncle Albert. That's right. There's no way you can take on board extra energy without also getting the extra heaviness that goes with it. Ah, it all begins to make sense. She stopped rubbing his shoulder and sat down again. Uh, thank you, uh, Gedenkin. That feels much better now, 
he said. I really must stop doing silly things. I'm getting too old for this. Well, I hope you don't stop. There are too many boring grown-ups all around us, he chuckled. Uncle, she said after a while, yes. Every time we have energy, we have heaviness. The heaviness that goes with that energy, right? Right. Well, then tell me, she said thoughtfully, regarding a small stone she had picked up. Would it be right to say that every time we have something that is heavy, there must also be energy there? Say that again, said Uncle Albert, looking intently at her. Well, this stone has got heaviness, right? It's heavy because of the stuff that's in it. Well, where does the stuff get its heaviness from? Is it also from energy? Is there energy in there, she said, pointing at the stone. Uncle Albert thought long and hard. Then he smiled and said, You know, Gedenken, there are times when I feel very proud of my little niece. He took the stone from her and looked at it closely. Yes, I think you must be right. There must be energy in there, and the heaviness of this stone is due to the energy that's inside it. Heaviness and energy, they must always go together. You can't have one without the other. But it's not moving, said Gedanken. I thought things had to move to have energy. Uh, no, not always. Energy is all about being able to do things. You don't have to be moving to be able to do things. A lump of coal, for instance. What do you mean? Well, a lump of coal can do things without moving, can't it? Well, boil kettles, you mean? Uh, yes, and uh, make steam trains move. Uh, coal contains energy, uh, not energy of movement, more of a kind of uh, locked-up energy. It's energy that can be changed into energy of movement if you want it to. But that stone isn't coal, said Gedankin. Are you saying it also has locked-up energy in it? Uh, yes, everything around us must have locked-up energy. Well, how much is in there? she asked, pointing at the stone. Uncle Albert screwed up his face and stroked his moustache, a sure sign he was doing mental arithmetic. After a while he announced, well, I would say something like the equivalent of 50,000 barrels of oil. She looked puzzled. A million pounds worth of oil, he added. In that stone, exclaimed Gedankin. That's right. A million pounds worth? Yes. And all in these other stones? Of course. That's unbelievable, she breathed. Then her eyes lit up. Uncle, we're rich. All we've got to do is get the energy out of the stones and the dirt and everything and sell it. Now, hold on, hold on, said Uncle Albert. It's not that easy. Just because the energy is in there doesn't mean to say we can get it out. Coal, wood, straw, yes. We get a tiny little bit of it out by burning those sorts of things. And up there in the sun he said, squinting upwards. Up there, you've got processes going on that get a lot more energy out. And that's why the sun is so hot. But most of the energy in most things will always stay locked up. Bother, said Gedankin sulkily. There's always a catch to it. Well, I, I don't know about that, said Uncle Albert. It's just as well it does stay locked up. Why? Don't you want to get rich? My dear, if it was simple for the locked-up energy to pop out, we'd be sitting on the equivalent of a gigantic bomb, he said, patting the ground. Gedankin looked around her nervously. I'm not sure I like the sound of that. <laughs> no, neither do I, he said. A troubled look came over Uncle Albert, as though he were brooding on something unpleasant. But before she could ask him about it, he laid back and put his hat over his face again and said, there was something else you wanted to ask me. There was, said Gedankin, looking unsure. Uh, something to do with the first trip you made. Uh, you said there were two things bothering you. Oh, yes, yes, uh, there was one other thing. Uh, you know, when I was chasing the light beam, uh, well, I don't know whether I told you, uh, but the light beam always seemed to be moving away from me at the same speed. Even when I was going close to the speed of light, it looked as though it was going away from me as fast as ever. Now, I'd have thought that was wrong. If I was really going that fast, I'd be nearly keeping pace with it. I'd have thought it ought to have looked as though it was going very much slower. 
You know, when you're in a car and there's another car in front of you that's going a bit faster, then it moves away from you quite slowly. Are you sure? said Uncle Albert. Well, yes, the car in front... No, 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 no. I, I didn't mean the car. I, I meant the light beam. You said it was going away from you at the same speed. Even towards the end, when you were up to your highest speeds. Well, yes, Skadankin replied a little uncertainly. At least I'm fairly sure that's what happened. Hmm. Curious. It always appeared to be going away from you at the same speed, you say? Yes. Interesting. Gedenkin waited and waited. But a gentle snore from under the hat announced that Uncle Albert had gone to sleep. <laughs>